are watching Gears. When it comes to building a really cool car truck, man, there's a lot that you can do to make it a hot rod. Wheels, tires, exhaust, supercharger, turbocharger. I mean, the list goes on. And they're all cool. But one of the oldest modifications that you can do that not only gives the engine more power, but gives it the look that you're after is multi-carbs, just sitting out there for everybody to see. And of course, the king of multi-carbs is three deuces. Now, back in the day, when guys were running old hot rod flatheads, they used these old three-bolt carbs, the Ford 94s and the Stromberg 97s, <laughs> and those kind of things. And they ran great. <laughs> so good, in fact, that in the 60s, manufacturers started offering a tri-power as a factory option on certain muscle cars. The most famous of these, of course, being the GTO. So, having a tri-power on your street machine has always been popular. The problem is, if you want one today, well, that is pretty much what you're going to be starting with. And it can be a little bit of a challenge to make something like this run right and be reliable. But it is possible, and that's what we're going to show you. Now, the first thing that you need is a manifold. And depending on what you're working on, your choices are eBay, a swap meet, or if you're working on a small block Chevy, you can go to Speedway Motors and get one of these brand new Edelbrock aluminum intakes. Now, take a look at this thing. As you can see, it's built for three GM Rochester two-barrel carburetors. Now, notice this is a four-bolt carburetor. You might be wondering about that. Well, the Rochester is a better carburetor than this, and it's also the same setup that was on the original GTOs and made those such a powerhouse. The next thing you're going to need is a big old handful of Rochester carburetors. Now, the good news is you can still find these things. You can get them at swap meets, you can get them at salvage yards across the nation, and they're still pretty inexpensive. The problem is, is that a guy gets a big old armload of these things, puts them on his intake, and then he can't understand why it runs like crap. He can't adjust it. He can't make it run well. The reason is the original tri-power setups on GTOs and cars like that had special outer carburetors. They were different than the center carb. They didn't have chokes. They didn't have idle mixture screws. They didn't have power valves. They were just open or closed, just like the secondaries of a four barrel. And you are never going to get three primary carburetors to run that way. It's just not going to happen. So the question is, where do you find these special outer carbs? <laughs> They're about as easy to find as Jimmy Hoffa. So we are going to show you how to make your own. Speedway Motors has got a kit that allows you to convert three primary Rochester carburetors into a real working tri-power. And as you can see, there is not a lot to this kit. You got some gaskets, you have some jets, you have linkage, and you have these very important base plates for the outer carbs. So we are going to convert these old derelict pieces of junk into something that you'd be proud to have on your car. But first, we need to take them apart and clean them up. <laughs> that can't be good. It sounds like broken glass. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Holy cow. Look at that, man. They're like little lizard skeletons. OK, the question is, how'd they get in there? That was, that was an unexpected plus. <laughs> Get the spider in there. <laughs> well, that's clean, man. That's a nice carburetor. Once everything's cleaned up, We'll start with the center carb and remove the stock throttle shaft, then install the extended throttle shaft and plates. Now you'll need to grind the weld off of the stock shaft so you can get the throttle lever off, then just install it on the new shaft. The next step is to take the Venturi cluster from the center carb, pull out these idle jet tips here on the outside, and just replace them with the new ones that come with the kit. Follow that by replacing the main jets 
and the power valve with the new ones. Then the final step is to replace the power valve piston in the lid of the carburetor. All right, once all your modifications are done and the carburetor is ready to go back together, now is the perfect time to take a few minutes and make everything look good. Now, I mean, you can put it back together like this, but why would you do that? You're putting all new parts in it. You might as well make the carburetors look like new. So for the base plate on the center carburetor, we're going to paint it with this silver, which is going to make it match these new base plates for the outer carbs. So that's going to look cool. Then for the carburetor bodies, we are going to use this special duplicolor wheel coating. Now this is a bronze look, which is going to be great on the body of that carburetor. And since it's made for wheels, it is extremely tough, which is what you want on a carburetor. Once everything is dry, reassemble the carburetor. Now, you're probably wondering where I got all this nice new polished hardware here. Well, there's actually nothing new about it. It's the original hardware that I just hit for a couple of seconds with a buffer. Look at that, came out looking like brand new. Now this is just a little thing, but believe me, it makes a world of difference on a project like this. And that takes care of the center carburetor. <laughs> One down, two more to go. Now, the good news is the outer carbs are even easier than the center because there's a lot less to them. So the first thing that we're gonna do is get rid of all choke-related parts because you do not need chokes in the outer carbs. Then, we're gonna take all the power valves, throw those in the junk heap, and we're gonna get rid of all these power valve plungers because you don't need those in the outer carbs either. Hey, welcome back to Gears, where today we are digging into one of the most desirable and legendary speed parts ever put on an engine. The tri-power, or three deuces, or whatever you want to call it. And we're showing you how to build your own functional system for whatever you're working on. Now, I started with just a handful of old junkyard carburetors, and I added to these a new intake and a kit from Speedway Motors, and as you can see, we are well on our way to having a really nice tri-power. What we're missing at this point are the two outer carbs, but I've got those over here. They're all painted up nice, ready for some new parts. So let's get back to it. Now, one of the cool things about this tri-power kit is that the outer carburetors come with special jets just like the center carb did. Now, the reason that's important as these are what make all these carburetors work together. So you don't have any stumbling or bogging or any of that other nasty stuff that's generally associated with a poorly designed tri-power. Since the power valve has been eliminated in the outer carbs, we'll plug the holes with the plugs provided in the kit. This is also a good time to plug the holes where the choke was, since that has been eliminated too. At this point, we are ready for the new base plates. Now, like I said before, these guys here are the key to having a tri-power that works correctly. Take a look at this. Now, when you compare the new plate to the original plate, <laughs> what a difference. Notice there's no holes here for any kind of vacuum. You don't have any ports for idle mixture screws, nothing. Just straight and to the point. Now, when this guy comes open, fuel goes in. How much fuel depends on how open they go. Then when they're closed, they're closed. That's it. No adjustment. With the bases in place, the last thing to do is reassemble the carbs. And bolt them on the intake. Okay, you got three carburetors. How in the world do you make them all work together? Well, simple. You just put on the linkage that comes with the kit and you are gonna be ready to roll. And that's it, that's a tri-power. Go ahead, man, take a look at it. 
Now, tuning one of these things, it's as simple as adjusting the single two barrel carburetor in the center because that's all you're running on when you're just out cruising around. So you actually get really good gas mileage until you hit about half throttle. That's when these other boys start to open up and <laughs> you better be holding on to something, man, because by the time this carburetor's wide open, these are wide open. Man, the sound of a tri-power wide open is incredible. That alone makes this worth doing. The best part is, this is something that you can actually do. It's affordable, and the cool factor is absolutely out the roof. Now, we've talked about three deuces, we've talked about tri-powers. When does this all become a six-pack? <laughs> when Mopar gets involved. We're gonna talk to you about that in a minute. <laughs> By 1969, the Hemi engine was becoming a real power on the racetracks across the nation. However, on the street, it was a little different story. The Hemi was expensive and it was heavy. It was hard to keep tuned because it was basically a racing engine that was detuned for the street. This meant that on any given night, a hot Pontiac or Chevy or Ford or Buick could give the big elephant a spanking. So, to fix that, Mopar took its already lethal 440 wedge engine and slapped on three two-barrel Holley carburetors and called it a 440 six-pack. And building a 440 with a six-pack on it would be a great engine to put in a 4x4 project or a hot rod or a muscle car, man, you name it. The problem is, finding a six-pack setup at a junkyard or a swap meet it's almost impossible, man. They are so rare. And if you do happen to find one that's got the carburetors, the intake, the whole air cleaner setup, man, you're gonna spend thousands of dollars on it and still have to rebuild it. So picking up some old junk carburetors and rebuilding them for a few hundred bucks is not really an option here. Fortunately, the guys at Summit Racing decided to do something about that. So they came out with a kit where you can build a legitimate six pack for your Mopar. That's what we're gonna do. The system starts with an aluminum high-rise intake manifold. Now take a look at this. This has got nice long runners and a dual plane design, so you get great low-end torque, which of course is what a six-pack was famous for. But it flows well enough that you get power all the way up to 6,500 RPM, so you get the best of both worlds, which is what you want in a street engine. Now the biggest difference you're gonna notice in this intake is in the carburetor mounting flange. Notice this is a lot bigger than what was over here on this old tri-power. That's because this was built for the GM Rochester carburetors. This is built for the Holley two barrels. Fortunately, Holley still makes these carburetors. You can get them brand new from Summit Racing. So no more rebuilding old junkyard carbs. Now the first one we're gonna put on is the center carb. It's 350 CFM and just like the tri-power over here, it's the one with the choke and all the linkage arms. The outer carburetors are next, and just like the Tri-Power, this is a matching set, except they're 500 CFM each, which is not like the Tri-Power. That's much bigger. Now notice, they don't have any chokes on them. They don't have any accelerator pumps. They're very stripped down, just like the Tri-Powers. They have a basic mechanical linkage, and then they have this big vacuum canister on the side because they're actuated mechanically or through vacuum. All right, take a look at how tight these things all fit together. Man, it looks like one big six barrel carburetor. A lot different than the look of the Tri-Power, which is three distinct carburetors. And both systems have their own look, their own style, their own place in hot rodding. Now, just in case you're counting, when you're running down the road, you're running on the center carburetor, 350 CFM, you crank this thing open, those outers open up, you go to over 1300 CFM. Yeah, that's some serious fuel, man. You put this on top of a built 440 and the only thing that's gonna outrun you is your gas gauge as you try to keep it full. Now, the problem with this sort of setup has always been an air cleaner because of the unique shape of the Holley flanges. 
Notice the tri powers are round. You can get air cleaners for these things anywhere. The Holly is a little different deal. Fortunately, Summit has got an answer for you. What we've got here is a replica of the six pack air cleaner that Mopar put on their cars. Now it starts with a metal base that seals down right over the hollies. Then we'll follow that up with the cleaner element and the lid. Now if you're building a six pack car, this is perfect. If you're not, all you have to do is come in and cut off some of that excess metal and you'll end up with a really nice air cleaner. Now obviously, since all this stuff is new, building one of these is a whole lot more expensive than doing that tri-power but it's still about half of what you'd pay for this kind of stuff at a swap meet. And it's ready to go on the car now, ready to run. That is a huge deal. Now, one other thing a lot of people don't realize, Ford and Chevy also had their own versions of a six pack using these kind of hollies. So you can use part of this kit to put one of those systems together. So, if you've always wanted a six pack or a tri-power, now you have no reason not to have it on your vehicle. Tooltech, brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals since 1919. You know, one problem that most people face in their shop is junk laying all around that needs to be moved. And while small things like boxes and tires are not that big a deal because they're light, easy to move around, big heavy things like rear ends and transmissions can be a real issue because they're so big and awkward. And having a dolly to move something like this around could be really nice. The thing is, a lot of people don't realize that the solution to this problem can be as close as your local hardware store. Matter of fact, it could be laying around you in the shop. So what we're gonna do is show you how to build some heavy duty axle dollies cheaply and quickly to move stuff like this around. And it's something you can do with or without a welder. Now, the first thing that you're gonna need is some steel for the base. And angle iron is perfect for that, especially if you've got some old scrap laying around like this frame that went to who knows what. Somebody was throwing this away, so I grabbed it just for a project like this. Now, the only thing that's important is to make sure you get it thick enough to handle the weight of whatever you're gonna be moving around. Notice this stuff is pretty stout. It's because those axles are heavy. The first step is to lay out the side rails and decide how long they need to be to support the axle properly. The next step is the end pieces, and they, just like the side rails, need to be wide enough to solidly support the axle. Finally, just weld or bolt them together with a heavy-duty caster in each corner. Now, I prefer the locking one so your parts don't roll around the shop when you don't want them to. Now, at this point, we have a very simple rolling dolly, but we're only halfway there because we want to get that rear end up in the air so we can work on it if we need to. So, the next step is to get some square tubing, cut it, and bolt it to the corners. Then, where the tubing crosses, drill a hole and bolt them together. The final piece is a single length of angle iron or square tubing that will serve as a cross member and bolt between the two uprights and support the front of the rear end to keep it from rotating down. And there it is, a heavy duty multi-purpose axle dolly that you can build for about 50 bucks if you buy everything. If you got stuff laying around, you can even do it cheaper than that. Now take a look at this. Notice it keeps the axle exactly where you want it but also gives you the ability to move it however you want to. Now, also notice that I added this little piece of plywood here. That creates a shelf where you can keep your tools and your parts when you're working on the differential or the brakes so it keeps everything together. The best part is, because it's bolted together, well, in just a few minutes you can pull these side pieces off, and then you've got a dolly that you can flop on an engine block or a transmission, something else heavy, and move it around. So as you can see, there is a ton of uses for something like this, which goes to show you that sometimes the best things don't come from here. They come from here. And now, what are you working on? 
For today's What Are You Working On, we are looking at a car that just about every one of us have either owned or worked on, and that's a Volkswagen Beetle. Now, this is owned by Frank Garhow Jr. from Bellevue, Nebraska, and he's got two of them. The first one is a 1959 that he picked up after somebody had worked on it. Take a look at it here. And in his own words, one thing led to another. The car wound up in his garage on a homemade fixture to separate the body and chassis. Now take a look at this picture. He's got this thing suspended from the ceiling, and then the body is supported on cinder blocks and boards. Now that goes to show you, man, you don't need all these expensive tools. They're nice to have, but there are other ways to do it if you use your imagination. And hopefully don't tear down the house and hurt anybody in the meantime. Now, he restored the chassis, it's all powder coated, all the bolts are replaced with stainless steel, and he's restored this car back completely original, down to the 36 horsepower engine and six volt system. Now, Frank says this is his daily driver, and he even used it as a getaway car when he got married last year. Here's a picture of him with his wife and the car. And with only 36 horsepower, you, uh, you probably weren't getting away any too quick, were you, Frank? <laughs> Which is probably why he built this next car. Now, this is a 61, and it's totally decked out. Check it out, man. The motor is punched to two liters. That is a turbo sitting on top of it. This is a sweet machine done in the California style. Totally different look. And he says it was actually featured in the February 06 edition of Hot VW's magazine. Man, for a car guy, it doesn't get any better than that. So that's it. You see what Frank's working on. You know what I'm working on. Next week, the Banshee is back. We'll see you then.